wants a boy He's got a nose like a carrot and a face like a fish And he goes to the church, goes to the church most Sundays. Goes with his little mother to the church on most Sundays. Wants to drop a bomb on his school most Mondays. natural guitar player I had to I learned to play I play my own way and I kind of in some ways rather rudimentary to some people's ears and eyes and it, uh, rooted in blues in a way but a little different and uh, so I, 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 you know, there was a sense of rejection sometimes people thought well who is this guy coming and play the guitar with his thumb and uh, you know yeah, this is not right you know but I really noticed that people liked what I did the first album I did was for John Peel's Dandelion label, which was uh, case history, I think, in 71, which is, what, 30 years ago now. I really do like my 70s album. Uh, Marjorie Razorblade sold a lot of copies all over the world. I think, no, I think, you know, by the standards of, uh, you know, uh, the Beatles or something, maybe not, or even whatever, you know, but I think they were good, steady-selling albums. They were available and around for a long, long time. The cover for this is from the Hypnosis, the people who did... Uh, all the Pink Floyd covers, and this was their vision of me. This uh, person jumping off the top of, of the building there. I think they must have paid some passerby to do that. But I've been um, uh, well known for doing my own uh, sleeves normally, but this is another one which this album sold very well, Matching Head and Feet. This one actually got in the top 30 in England, as I remember. But um, I can't remember the guy who did this, but at the time I used to wear these... Uh, these shoes a lot, and uh, they, I think people still wear them today. Sort of, we call them brothel creepers. Yeah, and I think Virgin actually printed some mugs with my face, you know, some cups with my face on. So, and this one is a Sanity Stomp, which is an album I made around the period when I had a nervous breakdown. And this little figure here was done by my son Robert. He drew, he drew this little thing when he was about eight or something, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, and a picture on the back too. That was from Robert. <laughs> Oh! 
people laughing at me, but I want to know why. I want to know why. There are lots of questions that need to be asked in, in terms of what kind of jobs this has an effect and um, what kind of situations, how did they actually measure attractiveness? Well, what are the things that you think make a woman or a man attractive? Well, that's an interesting question. Well, there seems to be quite a consensus about that now. Um, in terms of meeting someone for the first time, so when you're making a first impression, um, a, a well-proportioned, fairly symmetrical well, face goes down very well. Um, what large makes a eyes, woman attractive? particularly for women, um, are seen as being attractive. Relatively small nose and a fairly full mouth. Um, and you need a sort of fairly normal body weight to go with it. Mm. But that first impression, that, that sort of um, no, positive feeling we get for someone who looks like... <laughs> The first time I heard about Kevin Coyne when I was with a friend of mine in Mexico uh, for a holiday and she brought a tape along with uh, Kevin's songs and I listened to it and I thought, wow, that's great music. And many years later I moved uh, to Nuremberg and uh, visited my brother who lived in a very, very strange community. and. Uh, they had the name Kevin Coyne at their letterbox and I said to my brother, now I think you've gone completely mad, now I you even write Kevin Coyne on your letterbox. And he said, well, he's living here and I couldn't believe it. And later I saw him and I thought, this is unbelievable. A great man like him, lost, totally lost. And um, he was like a very strange stranger here. Didn't fit in at all and he had um, problems with his marriage, he was drinking heavily and he was really at the end of the line and he came to see a friend in Munich uh, to go to this famous beer festival, the Oktoberfest he was drinking very heavily and it nearly destroyed him and when I saw him he was really half dead he tried to stop drinking and um, he went to uh, Alcoholic Anonymous and uh, he carried on drinking, he went again and then he stopped. So I met him then a few times and uh, I tried to help him s just sort things out because he has lost everything, you know, he didn't have any money, he didn't have any friends and he was just like a lost soul. I mean, when you see him today, you know, it's, you know, you wouldn't believe it. Um, he often says, you know, moving to Nuremberg didn't do his career any good, of course, because all these people he knew before, nobody really helped him. He was so sensitive and um, I just thought he's a, a great artist and uh, this can't be, he can't go under, you know and uh, a man like him being destroyed by drink and by life and uh, other people this is not on and i got very angry to see wasted talent <laughs> 